Hello. Right, I will try again. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Thursday Tea Time Live. Uh, yeah, the um, my first attempt at, <laughs> at going live today, I'm afraid, ended in a little bit of a crash. So uh, I will try again. Um, <laughs> can't have it all can we every week I will try and get on on time I'm not too bad but anyway cheers this is coffee I promise it's not yet the Guinness mm. although that wouldn't be a bad a bad start to the afternoon but thank you for joining me I'm streaming live on Facebook and YouTube um, for our Thursday tea time history chat um, and as usual, actually, we've got quite a bit to talk about today. Um, I want to uh, talk about Prince Philip a little. Um, and and then we're going to talk about a few events which happened around this time of year in history, um, including the Titanic. We, we'll, we'll have a chat about the Titanic as well. Um, if you could give me a, a thumbs up or a like, if you can hear me uh, okay, that would be great as well, especially after my little crash with the, the equipment. It would be good to know it's working okay. Um, but yeah, so we'll talk about uh, some of the events which happened in history this week. Um, and, and also I've had a question in um, from, uh, I think it was Rachel, uh, thank you for your question. Asking me about statues, Ooh, uh, controversial, but also um, more specifically, do I have any favourite Tudor statues? So I will um, answer that a little later on as well. Now, while we're going, if you have got a question or a comment or you just want to say hi, please do um, go into the live chat and uh, and um, say hi. That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> hi Jane I hope you are well too yes I'm very well thank you the sunshine is out I've been for a run today which which um kind of accounts for why I'm a little bit late getting on hi Phil because I decided I just needed to get out the sunshine was uh is 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 out it is still a little bit chilly but um nothing that well, it's quite fresh actually it's lovely hi Vicky joining on Facebook so um yeah, anyway, so that's my excuse and I'm sticking to it. I was being I was being um healthy. <laughs> Trying to get out and about. So yeah, so I wanted to uh speak about Prince Philip. Then we're gonna go on and talk about some of the events which happened in history this week, including the Titanic, but there's also um some other ones that are of interest as well. Um and so welcome if you're catching me live on YouTube or Facebook. Welcome also if you're watching the um the playback and welcome if you're listening on the podcast because I take the audio from this and pop it on the podcast as well so that because I know I know some people um listen in the car so that's all very good um now I know it's, it's afternoon here now normally it would be afternoon tea but like I say I've actually just I'm still on the coffee I feel so behind this morning <laughs> well this afternoon <laughs> this afternoon I'm still on coffee normally it would be my morning drink anyway um so good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Good evening. Uh, well, so you might be having your your afternoon tea, your breakfast tea. But if you're down in Australia and New Zealand, like I know some of you are, maybe you're onto the chamomile because uh, it's a little bit late to be having any caffeine. Hi, Barbara. Uh, hi, Teresa. Thank you for joining. Um, yeah, anyone on YouTube as well, if you want to just pop something in the chat to let me know, because it's YouTube that I crashed out on. So <laughs> literally dropped everything. Um, so yeah, let me know that it's working. That would be fabulous. Um, so what else has been going on? As I mentioned last week, um, th well, thank you to everyone last week who who suggested um, uh, items that you must remember not to forget to pack that makes any sense so what's your top tips basically for things to make sure you pack if you're traveling to or around the UK and I recorded that was for the podcast that I was recording with Sarah Morris on the Friday so the day after um we did this last week so that podcast is now uh recorded and I believe it goes out Saturday um I think <clears throat> so I was going to say uh look out I'll when when she publishes it I will um I'll share it on my Instagram and um, and Facebook. So if you want to link to that, and that's uh, that will be there. I probably won't do that Saturday though because I'm having a little bit of a, 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 a you know 
it, basically it's just going to be about Philip on, on Saturday. I think that's the right way to go. So, uh, so I won't be showing anything else on Saturday. But so let's let's start off by Saturday because obviously we were together last Thursday. Um, welcome, Sandra. We were uh, together last um, yes Thursday, and of course we had the sad news that uh, Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, uh, longest serving consort to a monarch, um, had uh, had died. And of course, I don't know what day it is. This is Thursday, so Saturday is is his funeral. Um, so I didn't want to go by without just mentioning him. And um, I, I think he was an incredible character. Um, you know, one of these people. You know where you you stood with him. It seems, but his Duke of Edinburgh scheme, which. Um, my son took part in and I know lots of people um let me just check my mic's on yeah um lots of people have have been involved in over the years it was such an incredible scheme I mean it really did change people's lives I've read loads of comments and and um on Clubhouse they had rooms about about him and there were so many people from all over the world all sorts of walks of life just um re regaling tales of of their involvement in the Duke of Edinburgh scheme and how that changed um, their lives. So just for that, um, you know, he, he he really is somebody worth remembering. Now, of course, he's got to have a – well, actually, I say got to have a small funeral. He wanted a small funeral, private family funeral, and that um, that is what he's getting. So that's kind of nice that he's um, – COVID or no, it, it's turned out the way he would have wanted it. So I just wanted to, to mention him before we, uh, before we get going on anything. Um, Okay, so what else happened in this week in British history or history? Mm. Obviously, I'm going to take the British slant. But today, 15th of April, is the anniversary, as uh, some of you will know, of the sinking, the, the, the day the Titanic sank. Hi, Dylan. Hi, James. Jane. <laughs> Sorry, Jane, I just renamed you. Um, um, yes, so the 15th, so the... the um, the Titanic hit the iceberg late on, on the 14th of April. And, um, and she sank, uh, I think it was two hours, 40 minutes later. So into the early hours of the 15th, but of course that depends on what time zone you are, you're in as well. So, but anyway, that it, it is the, it is the anniversary. That was, that was 1912. So, um, you know, pre the world wars, it's, it's kind of, it's different, you know different era totally um and uh any one of you who are in um my patreon you have access to a full hour video with gareth russell talking about the aftermath of the titanic and the reason i wanted to ask him about the aftermath was because the well the more you look into the titanic story the more that the, the bigger it becomes the, the more you realize how uh, impactful it was, not just on kind of public conscious, but um, the individuals. And of course, we think a lot about the passengers, but what about the crew? There's another book actually that was I was going to recommend at the end, but it's it's pertinent to now, so I might as well do it now. Um, Julie Cook. Let me see if I can get a larger image of that. Has written this book called um, The Titanic and the City of Widows It Left Behind. Now, she and Gareth did a YouTube video, which you can find, where they talked about their um, – they, they took questions and, and they answered questions from people about the Titanic. Now, um, Julie's uh, angle is from the widows left in Belfast because a lot of the crew – a lot of the um, – yeah, the crew, not not sort of in the in the stokers and the engineers, and they were in because this was a maiden voyage. You would send um, kind of like a crack team, if you like, of engineers and 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 whatever to find those inevitable issues that were going to happen on a first voyage. So a lot of them came from the Harland and Wolf um, shipbuilding yard, which was in, in Belfast, and they were majority went down I think I don't know if it's all or most of them went down with the ship so you've got you've got not just the the city of Belfast bereft because of the impact 
psychologically of the ship that they've just seen leave really proud of their city for creating um they know that it sank but literally they've lost you know their men folk um so uh so yeah, so uh, so Julie's uh, Julie's sorry Julie's book is on my reading list. So I've not I've not read it yet, but I have watched her interview with Gareth their their chat on YouTube, and um, and that's very very uh, that's very worthwhile looking at. Now Gareth Russell is um, the author of of the other Titanic book, which I've spoken about lots before. Um, Sink of the Titanic and the End of the Edwardian Era. So he, that's a fabulous book to pick up. Um, he weaves in the narrative of just well, the the just what was happening in Europe, America, uh, Ireland. It, it's really incredible how he 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 basically tells the story through. <coughs> excuse me, ex through um, passengers that were on the ship. So people he's been able to trace their story. Um, Anyway, so the interview I did with him was about the aftermath because of this impact that the, the Titanic had. Um, and I wanted to explore the actual, um, the rescue. So, you know, what happened with the, the, on the Carpathia, which was the, the ship that picked up the survivors and, and what happened when they docked in New York. And then the aftermath the um the I can't remember the name of it but the the film that was created really soon after really really soon after um which I think possibly helped cement it in uh, in in the public consciousness and in in as a story that could be uh, dramatized but um anyway so that so yes yeah, so Titanic that's well well worth the mention today isn't it Gareth's actually got a new podcast as well called Single Malt History and he's done a daily um episode on the Titanic so that's worth looking up it's a yellowy gold um uh logo it's really it's you'll so you'll you'll notice it when you when you uh search for it hmm. and Gareth's um so on Clubhouse, any of you who are on Clubhouse, uh, we've done we, we've just finished actually a series of three rooms uh, specials about the Titanic. Now, again, if you want to come onto Clubhouse and you're on iPhone, it's like um, it's like us doing this, but you can't see me. <laughs> so it's like lots of rooms of discussions. We we do more well, we do history talks, obviously, um, history and traveling history. Uh, so if you want to get on Clubhouse in your iPhone, it is, I believe, coming out on Android next month, May. But um, if you're not on there and you want to be, then please feel free to direct message me um, through Instagram, which no, none of you are watching me on at the moment. So that's very helpful, isn't it? But you, if you find me on Instagram at British underscore history underscore tours and send me a message there, I can send you an invite to Clubhouse. Um, but uh in terms of other things, so we have uh, this week I've put out, I can't remember, I don't think I mentioned it last week. It might have been ready for last week and I forgot, but um, a video did about the Union Jack. Does that sound boring? Is that why? <laughs> yes, I'm going to talk about a flag. But the, but the interesting thing about that was um, it, it was designed at the time of James VI of Scotland, James I of England, when he became the the monarch on in both countries because of course the countries weren't combined just because we had the same monarch that that's not how it goes um but the problem came with we're an island so we've got the same waters so are you going to change the flag that's flying on the king's ships which are the same whether they're uh, sailing around scotland or sailing around england uh, are you going to change the flag when it changes waters? No. Okay, so we need a new flag. Anyway, so that's where the Union Jack comes from. And apparently that's why we call it the Jack, which is actually the name of a flag on a ship. Some of you may know more about sailing than I do. but So, no, I've done a video about that. Um, I've done one about Richard the Lionheart, who died in this week in, oh, gosh, I haven't written, is it 1189? something around there. Anyway, there's a video on it. You can go check it out. Now he is, so Richard the Lionheart. Yeah, this, this, um, he, he reigned for 10 years here and spent about six months here. 
He, uh, hi Liz, hi Tim for joining, welcome. Um, so yeah, Richard the Lionheart, or uh, it was it was the, the, the nobility and the, the monarchy, all the ruling classes were still speaking Norman French at that time, so Cour de Lyon. Um, and he, so like I say, reigned for 10 years, spent six months in uh, in England, and really, I th from what I gather, treated the country um, really as just the funding route for him to go off to, um, oh, Barbara, thank you for that. Um, the the Sorry, funding to go off to do to crusade. Um, he was a big crusader. Uh, he also spent some time in prison on the continent. Now, that's where we think potentially the Cour de Lyon ta tag came from because his mother um, needed to raise the ransom for for him, and so it's a bit of um, bit of a propaganda type style, you know, name. If you name somebody, you know, he's Richard, he's your king, he's Richard the Lionheart, then people are more likely to give some cash towards getting him back. Um, now I've covered actually, so it's his, it's it's the anniversary of his death. Now his death is um, death isn't amusing, obviously, but. <laughs> his um his attitude towards it is was was funny he he was siege in a castle and i can't remember where off the top of my head i'm sorry um somewhere in france and he received an arrow wound uh, sorry an arrow so yeah someone shot him in the in the shoulder and he forgave that he pardoned the um the the archer um because he was quite impressed with the shot <laughs> <laughs> some that sort of professional um courtesy I don't know there he was sort of oh, good shot sir anyway and uh and pardoned him um his men didn't though once Richard died I'm afraid the uh the, the man who went once he was captured uh had a very nasty ending watch the video I'll tell you all about it Barbara also da Vinci's birthday cool love a bit of da Vinci can't wait to get back to Florence there's a Da Vinci, um, obviously there's big links to, to him there. And the anniversary of the Hillsborough disaster, of course. Oh, gosh, yes. Well, the Hillsborough disaster, um, I'm going to have to remember, try and remember the details off the top of my uh, head. Um, and this was a, was it a cup final? Oh, it was just, it was just a horrendous um, football stadium disaster. Um that makes me just weep. There's two. There's two um, events in history that just leave me. I, I struggle to talk about them. Hillsborough and um, Aberfan. There, I've done a video on Aberfan, and you'll see. I really did uh, struggle with it. The Aberfan disaster and Hillsborough is the other one. Um, I can't remember what year. I was quite small, I think, when it happened, but I remember the coverage. Um, and obviously the aftermath, the blame game, um, and that horrendous uh, blaming the the fans and oh, uh, um, and, and children die. Oh yes, but thank you, um, Barbara, for bringing that up because yes, we should remember them oh, absolutely. Um, another video I've put out this week: the Earl of Bothwell semi final. Notts Forest, Liverpool. I knew it was Liverpool, Barbara. Yeah, and Notts Forest was it? That there's Doug. Thank you. Yeah, F, F, FA Cup semi final, and um, uh, the coverage that the Sun newspaper gave, um, 1989. Thank you, Jane. Yeah. So yeah, I'd have been ten. Um, the yeah, Barbara says those two those two events for her too. The coverage, I believe that this well, I know this that the Sun gave of the Sun newspaper gave of the uh, disaster. Um, uh, actually, led to that you you still you can't buy the Sun in Liverpool. <laughs> that is it. You, you don't. They no one will stock it. You no one will buy it. You do not buy the Sun newspaper in Liverpool. Um, so sorry, excuse me. I'm sorry, I can stick my arm in people's faces on YouTube. Tim asks, Timothy, sorry, uh, why was going on crusade so important to Richard? 
was there pressure from Saladin to invade England? I, I think um, I, I, it, it's a period of history that I, I want to learn a lot, lot more about. So I can only give you kind of the uh, the overview. I mean, being um, th- th- being that that well, crusading was very important. It was all about looking like you were doing the right thing. I think. And, and securing your place in in heaven as well, um, and mm, it, it, the ruling, you know, the the the, the ruling classes. I was going to say, but the it was, it was a position that they were given, you know, by God or by 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 you know. So they they really believed that they were just there by right, of course. And um it wasn't the kind of leadership that we want and and, and ask for in a democracy now. Um they they were much more selfish. And I think the crusading gave them the prowess. I wonder though whether they were more um aware of how they would appear in history potentially as well and that gave some impetus to um to that need to to go out and do do something but yeah I mean land is always yeah when it comes to it what is it really about usually land money yeah but 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 Timothy that is something that I am um, I will be uh I'm getting my way back there. So in the moment I'm reading and researching about the anarchy. So the 19 years where you've got Stephen and uh, uh, Empress Matilda fighting it out. Um, So I'm, I'm getting into that period. I've, I've done a lot. um, I suppose my main focus has been Tudors, um, but I am definitely branching out now into other. um, Oh, and Romans, Roman history I love as well. But yeah, I'm kind of. I need to do the middle bit. Thank you for the question, though, Timothy. Um, so Tudorish related, the Earl of Bothwell died this uh, in this week. Fifteen. Oh, that's how I'm going to remember. Fifteen sixty-five. Don't know something like that. But he um, died in uh, captivity in Denmark, um, in a castle called Drag's Home Castle, I think it is. Again, I've got the video out about it. Um, now, of course, uh, 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 he was the uh, third husband of Mary, Queen of Scots. And when Mary, Queen of Scots um, it, it effectively escapes Scotland, she's been ousted from the throne, she escapes Scotland, um, and Bothwell escapes too. And then I kind of... I've always followed Mary's story, of course. I mean, she spends the next 19, nearly 20 years in England in captivity and obviously gets executed at the end. And um, and and she's an incredibly interesting character. But her husband goes, um, manages to escape over the sea. Now, he's already spent time in Scandinavia as a younger man. And what he managed to do while he was there, um, yes, yeah, sorry, Barbara, yes, um, Earl of Bothwell, uh, yeah, third husband of Mary Queen of Scots, and he, um, as a younger man, spending time in Scandinavia, married potentially this uh, a lady called Anna, and I can't remember her, her surname. But anyway, um, now he treated her very badly, persuaded her to get her family to give him loads of cash, and probably then with that cash came back to Scotland anyway so already uh not the greatest type of husband so anyway when he tries to escape back to Scandinavia he gets captured and ends up back in the uh town where can you hear the workman outside um back in the town where his estranged ex-wife is is so he gets into a whole heap of trouble. Uh, anyway, ends up in um, in in captivity. I think it's Frederick, King Frederick the might be the first actually of Denmark um, in in Dragstone Castle. Now, with Mary's demise back in England, where 
that thought, oh, maybe this is a this that I could get a ransom for this this guy. No, that all that all ebbs away, and he becomes a useless prisoner, and he's left in the dungeons of Drag's home cast Drag's home castle. Sorry if I'm pronouncing that totally wrong, and um, and chained to a pillar. 1578. Thank you, Doug. Oh, you were listening yesterday. <laughs> You're taking more notice of me yesterday than I was of me yesterday. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and yes, yeah, so, and, and it's apparently chained to a pillar. And so there's a um, a groove in the floor where he just walked around this pillar and he went insane as uh, anyone would. It was basically in, in solitary confinement, not able to move um plenty of time to think on his life and the way it had gone so um yeah but he was he wasn't a nice one but that wasn't a nice end anyway i've got a video about that as well um and the other one i've got out is edward the fourth versus warwick the kingmaker um and this is the battle of barnet which although it's not the final battle of the wars of the roses or at least the first part of the Wars of the Roses and although it wasn't the first uh, sorry the the last battle it was the most decisive um with the Earl of Warwick uh Warwick the Kingmaker otherwise known as um actually dying at on the battlefield so um and that was yeah that was very significant um so anyway I, I watched that video as well <laughs> that's it's quite good they were all about um I've done them they're all quite short. They're all about between three and five minutes long, because they 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 are an introduction. But I've I've tried not to be too just high level and and skip over any details. I have tried to put stuff in there that um, that's a bit more interesting. The other one that's well, they're, they're all still on there, but the um, uh, Tilbury uh, Fort speech. That video is on there as well on YouTube. I keep saying there on YouTube, and um, that's where I went to actually find where Elizabeth I delivered the Tilbury Fort speech. This is the "I have the heart." No, I may have. I have, may have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king and a king of England too. Not only does she deliver that speech, possibly over and over again, because you've got to imagine she's on a hillside um, where Tilbury is, obviously. They're waiting, awaiting the, the Spanish Armada potentially invading. So they're on the coast. Um, they're up a hill. There's loads of um, soldiers there. And so she she potentially delivered this speech um, a number of times. Um, and there are there are three um different um oh Jane, Jane liked the Tilbury Fort video. Thank you. Uh, there are three different accounts still written down, three different versions of each. So um, that might account for, well, I go, I go through it in the video, but that might account for why we have slightly different versions. It's not like a politician or, or somebody giving a speech nowadays and they've got, um, you know, they've got it all written down and, and then it's just re or it's videoed or recorded and then and then you you hear the original over and over again she may well have delivered it a few times um so that people could have heard um so that so that that one i, I really like and the other one was um i don't want an arthur tudor yes because of course because arthur tudor died as well um in april 1502 Do you know what? Historians are notoriously bad with dates. <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> I think it might be because you've got to think of so many. And they're arbitrary, aren't they? they there's nothing inherent in them that made it have to be that date or time. So you literally have just got to remember them. And then you've got lots to remember. So anyway, I, before I go on, I want to give a shout out to um, Rachel, who's joined my YouTube channel. So you can join me on YouTube now. You can actually join. So there's the Patreon if you want blogs and live events and historian interviews. And then um, on YouTube, you can join me as well. And um, you can join me from 99p on YouTube. And you get, if Rachel was on, you'd be able to see she's got a special badge, which is quite cool. And uh, and you get special stickers and stuff. And then you can choose there's different levels um, and you get different things. Now, other things I've been up to as well. 
So lots on Clubhouse. I won't keep going on about Clubhouse because if you're not on, it's going to be irritating. But I will tell you about what um, what we've been doing on there. Now, Clubhouse is all live, so I don't have any recordings of it to share with you, um, although we might start looking into potentially working out how to uh, record some of our rooms so that we can share it elsewhere. Um, but we do... Um, we do everything from a chilled Tudor history chat on a Wednesday morning, that's Sarah Morris and I, uh, to history after dark, which we do on a Wednesday evening. <laughs> now, this one's funny. Well, it's fun. And I do this with Dr. Cat, who you might know, does Reading the Past um, on YouTube, and with Catherine B Brooks, who is the, the Tudor tracker. And um, last night we were talking about the history of toilets and <laughs> drainage systems which sounds boring, but actually it was very interesting. I thought everyone came in and everyone stayed, so I'm taking it that they found it interesting. We, we covered we covered all sorts. We, I, I covered the story of the um, the, the mantua, do you know, the, these big Georgian uh, gowns that, 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 that became fashionable in the Georgian period at court. So these really, I'm going like this because the, the dresses were, they're, they're flat and, and long, uh, you know, they one was two and a half metres. I think it's one in the Scottish uh, Museum of Scotland. It's two and a half metres wide. So, so if if obviously if the the doorway is wide enough, you'd be okay. But otherwise, you've got to do some sort of crab manoeuvre um, through the door. But how do you go to the toilet in one of these things? Well, well, we we covered that last night, and it's um, a bourdeloo. Have you have you heard of these? My French accent is so amazing, isn't it? Bourdeloo. Uh, and it looks like a, they look like a gravy boat and they're basically imagine a gravy boat um and it would be it would be so there's like i i, I think there's like the, the 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 material in the back of the dress laps over and um you would uh ciao monica and you would um you would call over the um servant boy I don't know what, what the proper name would be sorry I don't mean to say servant boy but anyway you would call over the boy you would have these poor poor little boy and he would have to <laughs> maneuver it into the back of the dress and the lady would cl clamp her legs around this bordeloo you can see why this is the history after dark uh, topics right <laughs> and uh, and she would do her business there and then in like in the same room as she's still chatting to people um I think that that sounds like it takes quite a bit of skill to me but then I suppose you know if you're at court all day every day in these dresses that you'll soon become well practiced but anyway so we could we covered the the history of going to the toilet yesterday last night we've done the history of sex work we've done rude place names we've done um we've done uh medical cock-ups uh oh gosh what else have we done loads loads it's good it's good fun it's really good fun so if you want to get on club s honestly we are having a good a good time on there and um and because it's live you get you get to come up and chat as well if you if you want to it's not by no means um necessary if you just want to sit and listen and we uh we covered um we do a history half hour on a Monday and a Friday. Sometimes it's Tudors and sometimes it's general history. But we did What Do You Love About Tudor History? And I think I asked I think I asked you lot that last, last week, didn't I, in preparation for that room. Um, so that was that was fun. And we've got, well, we did Cads, Villains and Ne'er-Do-Wells of Tudor England. Now, the nominations were, um, mine was Thomas Seymour, First Baron Dudley. That was that was the younger brother of Edward Seymour, um, and he's the one who married Catherine Parr. So he was mine. We had Richard Rich. He's the guy who tortured. Um, um, oh, you tell me, and I'll tell you. Uh, the the lady who was tortured in the Tower of London, the rack. Uh, anyway, he he literally physically did that because the uh, the 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 um, steward of the tower refused um richard rich th uh, third duke of norfolk um and oh who's the other one it'll come to me but anyway so we, we 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 put forward our cases for for who should be um who should be the villain of tudor england but 
well, I'm saying England, sorry, Tudor times, because uh, actually, and maybe this is why he wasn't included. I think maybe the Earl of well could have could have gone in there. He could have gone in there, absolutely. Now, this Friday, which is tomorrow, <laughs> uh, we're doing funerals, sorry, Royal Deaths Protocols and Funerals, obviously with a bit of a, uh, well, with a large nod to the fact that we've got Prince Philip's funeral on Saturday. I'm sorry if that's very noisy outside. Someone's, Anne Askey, thank you, Barbara. I, do you know, I'd got A in my head and I was going through all the names, <laughs> female names beginning with A. Anne Askew, yes. Now, Anne Askew potentially did have um, information that would have got Catherine um, Parr, I think, um, into into a lot of bother. And she um, she did not talk. Very, very, very principled and brave lady. So damaged that when they took her to be um, burnt at the stake, uh, she had to go on a chair. She couldn't even walk. Absolutely horrendous. So Richard Rich, the, the, the one who... Uh, the one who instigated that torture, I think he actually won. He won being the villain uh, and uh, of Tudor England for us. Um, and then next, oh, let's do this, right? So next week we're doing our favourite what-ifs of Tudor history. So, you know when we talk about things like Arthur dying or, um, uh, you know, what if... Catherine had had a son. Welcome, Roger. What if? Um, and all the all these. So, what our favourite what ifs of Tudor history uh, are, and we're going to be doing that in a bit of a. Let's see where this takes us, and because yeah, so um, because a new one that that came up for me. Um, and I apologise because I can't remember who 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 I was talking to at the time. Was what if Catherine? of Aragon had just accepted her divorce what if she hadn't fought against the divorce we 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 know the story we know how hard she fought we we know how, how, how she did not want that to happen she did not believe it was the right thing to do and she did not want it to happen um but what if she had just accepted a divorce how different would her life have turned out would Anne Boleyn's life have turned out? Would the children involved in all of that, how different would that have turned out? And then consequently their behaviours as adults, how would that have turned out? Would we have even had Edward? Um, would Anne have been able to have children at an earlier stage in her life and therefore maybe had more? Maybe there would have been a, a boy. Oh, it just, isn't it fun? So that's what we're going to be doing on Monday. Supposedly in half an hour, I can't see it myself. Thinking about it now, I'm thinking that's going to be that's going to be a while. Um, let me show you something I promised to show you last week, and um, and I didn't have it ready. Um, I mentioned to you that my daughter has been um, she's an artiste, and she has done a bee necklace and I've got it up on my shop so oh, I don't know if you can see it um basically we've got all sorts of stuff on there that she's done I'm going to get a phone case because I've got a new phone and it desperately needs to be protected from me dropping it um but yeah you've got you've got Anne Boleyn's bee necklace that she's drawn um and um we've got all sorts so there's a pillow there's a clock you can just get cards greeting cards with it on you can get um well I said clock didn't I there's just there's all sorts of um cool stuff a throw that looks quite nice the throw with um uh it's because it's, cause it's a bit black with obviously the the per she's done it pearlescent as well you can't really see it on the uh me showing you like that but the pearls are, are, are they look shiny <laughs> you can tell I'm not the artist can't you <laughs> they look shiny um yeah so anyway that's all available on Redbubble so um you can you can um you can take a look at that if you want I've I've got the link on my bio um Jane has got another what if for us what if Anne of Cleves hadn't have accepted her fate would Henry have taken her her head too Hmm. Very interesting. Now, Anne of Cleves is um, 
she's somebody that we, we really don't know enough about. Um, but um, I, th I think there are, there is, there are people now, you know, looking at doing a proper biography of her. Now, of course, Anna Cleves is the, she outlived them all as well. So not only did she survive her um, very short six month marriage to Henry VIII, she was then, and and then you know then she was she was a wealthy um, a wealthy woman in her own right. Then she was welcomed at court. She had good relationships with all of Henry's children. She had a good relationship with Henry. She even hoped on the downfall of uh, Catherine Howard that he might reconsider marrying her. So, which which then lends the um, a bit of doubt into. Uh, she she did she was a very rich woman she did have properties but it lends a little bit of doubt into the assumption that she kind of knew what she was she did know what she was doing I'm sure when she accepted the divorce but she was hopeful that he might remarry her when Catherine of Howard um, when Catherine Howard um, yeah sorry Barbara's just asked, put done another what if what if Richard the Third son had survived. The, the the changes of fortune based on people dying at the wrong time. Um, so I suppose we've got the potential of people who've not been born, but yes, absolutely. The, the the people in line to the throne who've died. I'm doing a monarchy series actually soon. It's in the planning, and I've got other historians coming in to help tell the story. And we're literally going from. I wanted to go further back than um, than William because we always start at William, and there's plenty of kings uh, beforehand but um for the purposes of of keeping it uh planned well i'm going to start there and th th and i'm looking at specifically the transfer of power each time and what happened who it went from and to but who else potentially it should have gone to or would have gone to had something else not happened so um and 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 obviously children and, and dying before their time or in battle in the um, case of the, the uh, Henry VI's son, um, the Prince of Wales, um, he, he's buried in Tewkesbury, uh, Tewkesbury Abbey. I always sort of say Cathedral, Tewkesbury Abbey. Um, yeah, he died in battle. So, yeah, there's lots of what ifs. Now, shall I get on to uh, statues? <laughs> So this is this this has come from a question. I think I've had it a couple of times actually, um, um, about statues, and um, uh, Rachel, I think it was, has asked me. Oh, thank you, Doug, for doing that. Someone's tried to ring me. Get away. Um, someone's asked me generally about statues, but more specifically about Tudor statues. And do I have a favourite Tudor statue? Well, I do. And I can tell you about it. <laughs> and it's going to be your favourite one as well after I tell you about it, I think. Now, my general thoughts on statues are there is statue. So when there's a statue, what I think is uh, part of the story of those statues is why were they put up now what one of the things I've noticed um and I'm researching things so let's take Richard the Lionheart for example if you watch my video on him you will see uh, the statue of him on now why is there a statue of a man who spent six months of his 10-year reign in the country and basically use the country to fund his crusades. Why Why would there be a statue of him up there? Well, the, his, his statue originally stood outside Crystal Palace. Crystal Palace, the Victorian Crystal Palace. Um, and there was, there was this nostalgia during the Victorian era and um, Prince Albert himself um, was behind a lot of it as well, where a lot of statues went up. Um, now I'd have to look into it more. Maybe each individual statue warrants looking into in its own right, but as to why that person was chosen. And I, I would, I would, I would, I would 
wager that in many cases there wasn't really a big, great, potentially sensible reason behind choosing them. <laughs> um, so, so that's one thing I think the history of why the why the statue was actually there is is always worth looking at because then I then I, I'm just not sure they take on the importance that they uh, they're sometimes given. Um, also, nobody puts a statue up to someone who hasn't done something that they've interpreted as good at the time. So lots of people who made money in ways that we would not, um, we, we think is abhorrent, then th the reason there might be a statue to them is because you'll probably find they built a hospital or a library or something else. In an age where you couldn't show your wealth with Porsches and I don't know, whatever, you know, you'd get your name recognized by providing a um a building in the community. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it doesn't mean that they should be looked at now, potentially, but I I think there's maybe a bit more energy wasted on on doing it than necessary. But let me tell you about my Tudor statue that I think you will, if you don't already know about it, you'll be quite excited that I've told you about it. I think. So my favourite Tudor statue is a statue of Elizabeth I. And the reason, the main reason why it's my favourite is because um, it is contemporary. So it was carved in, um, I've got it written down because you know what I'm like with dates by now, 1586. So Elizabeth dies um, 1603. <laughs> Another date maybe I should have written down. And so this is contemporary. And it um, it's not only contemporary to her, but it's it's the oldest out it's outdoor oldest outdoor statue in London. On top of that, it is really easily missed. It wouldn't have been originally because originally it adorned the Lud Gate, so the, one of the gates into the city of London. But um, but that that gate was removed in um, 1760, and the um, the statue there was there was. King Lud and his sons, and there was Elizabeth on the statue. I think they're on either side, um, either direction, if you like. And the statues ended up being, uh, um, I was going to say conserved, but not really, stored um, in cellars of a, of a pub. Um, and um, so when uh, there was, there's, a, there's a church called St Dunstan's on Fleet Street, and when that was rebuilt, the uh, the statue of Elizabeth was renovated, refitted, and and put there. Now I'm going to show you. I'm hoping you can see this. If not, look up um, St Dunstan's on Fleet Street. Oh, this is the reason why you might not know where it is. I'll show, I'll show you. So this is St Dunstan's. This is the headquarters of one of the papers. I can't remember. So if I show you that, this is St Dunstan's. This is a news, because we're on Fleet Street, so this is our newspaper area. <laughs> now the statue is in, on is above a porch way, above a porch, sorry, in there. <laughs> so you fly past that on a bus or uh, in a car or in a taxi and you won't... Um, you won't see it. And this is it. There's more to this story. Yes, Barbara, I know. I must go and see it as well. Because I, I have, I'm, I'm guilty of this as well. I have, fl I have flown past this statue. Um, now it is set back, which is probably good in terms of conservation wise, not quite so good in terms of actually seeing it. <laughs> we'll have to have a walk down Fleet Street. When I get to London, I'll do a live from there, shall I? And we can um, we can view it together. So yeah, so um, what did I say? Fifteen sixty eight. So this is above the porch. Now there is a follow on story to this as well. So you know, I said that the statue was um, in basically a pub cellar. So it needed to be paid to be you know refitted, restored, and put put somewhere. So this is on on. Uh, the St. Dunstan's was rebuilt. I've got that written down. 1833. So, so, so this was then re um, fitted. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, 
the uh, sorry so the people that obviously it costs money one of the people who donated money was Millicent Fawcett one of the suffragettes who you may so you may have heard of her name um and she unveiled the statue in 1926 I think it was 28 sorry she unveiled the statue um in 1928 and um she was already 80 years old at the time and she left 700 pounds in her will for you know, toward the upkeep of this statue so there you have it elizabeth the first has the oldest outdoor statue in um in london and it's contemporary to her so 1568 i i mean it's it's i i find the dress um Oh, so she's she's got the orb and scepter, and so she's in her sort of coronation regalia. Um, I find the, the dress interesting. It's not quite as um, it it looks a bit more realistic than than in portraits. You know, when in portraits, the the sort of the, the way the dress hangs is a little bit uh, like wow, how do they do that? Probably didn't. That's why. Um, but this looks a little bit more realistic. So anyway, so there you go. There's my favourite. Tudor statue um hidden away it's there when you know where to look for it so um now you know where to look for it and you can go and find it and yes when I make it to London I will do a live from there I promise you and we can um we can go and have a look at it together is that all right does that sound good I think that sounds good so I am going to leave you for another week thank you so much for joining me so remember that book um julie cook's book about uh, the titanic the city of widows um it's called the titanic and the city of widows it left behind the forgotten victims of the fatal voyage um very really interesting book check out gareth russell's uh podcast single malt history because he's done a series of episodes this week about the uh, the run-up to the sinking um and that's really good anyway he's a fantastic historian you'll be very glad you found him if you haven't already um but for now have I got anything else to say I don't think I probably have so thank you for joining me and I will see you again this time next week I hope you all have a fabulous week stay safe bye Bye, everyone.